Yep. Hello, everyone, especially my students at John Jay College of Criminal Justice in New York City. June 13, 2017 makes the 51st anniversary of the U.S. Supreme Court decision, which better known as the Miranda decision. We are announcing a new project that will be launched soon that includes stories told by the investigating officer himself, Carol Cooley. He is the man who arrested Ernesto Miranda back in 1963. So here's an opportunity for you to listen in and exactly what happened that day. Something we don't get a chance to see on television, nor do we get a chance to read in textbooks. Carol Cooley from the Phoenix Police Department. At the time we're gonna talk about it today was Detective Cooley and the Ernesto Miranda case, which we're gonna talk about today. Carol, thanks for taking the time to uh, talk with me today. It's my pleasure to have you here in my home uh, so that can we, we can talk about this. Very good. Also included are phone interviews with two attorneys located in Phoenix who were part of the Miranda's legal team that played a pivotal role in the Supreme Court decision. These men were young and just began their legal careers. From over 50 years ago, they recall details and events that are now part of American history. The attorney discussed why the Miranda decision was so controversial and continues to be controversial to this day. My team is compiling a comprehensive collection of information, images, maps, and video that we hope will benefit not only my students at John Jay College of Criminal Justice, but anyone interested in studying the topic. It will also be of interest to anyone that is teaching this and can use the materials to help with their curriculum. You can contact my team directly using the following links. And thanks for watching and hope to see you soon. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank the Phoenix Police Museum for helping us with this project. Without you guys, this couldn't have been possible. So thank you very much. We'll be uploading seven videos and three scholastic challenges that will help my students study the investigation, arrests, and subsequent court history surrounding Ernesto Miranda and the police warnings that we still use today. This will be a learning experience that comes directly from the young men that were involved in the front lines started in 1963. In the summer of 2016, I traveled with my team to Phoenix to sit down with Carol Cooley, ask questions, capture the story on video, and tell us his take on the Miranda decision. Here are some samples that will show you how valuable Detective Carol Cooley's contribution to this project were. The report was from Sunday, uh, early in the morning, sometime around midnight, a little after, and it was a kidnapping and a rape and a robbery. So according to the FBI Uniform Crime Report, any eight major felony always gets listed first on the top of the complaint report. So in this case, the rape would have been charged number one, even though kidnapping was a higher class felony. And if you want to learn more about the Uniform Crime Report and how crimes get reported, you can always turn to my textbook. We have a whole chapter, chapter 11, on the introduction to special investigations. And it talks about the Uniform Crime Report, why it's, in, it, why it's involved, and what we do with it. He did note the license number, DFL 312. I have a wrong license number. What's this about? We said, well, we're here to talk to you about a police matter. He said, well, come in. So we go into the house, Bill and I. And he said, what's this about? We said, well, uh, Ernie would rather not talk to you here in front of your family. Right. It's a police matter. But if you come to the department with us, we'll talk about it there. If you're not involved in this police matter, we'll bring you home. You're not under arrest. Three guys that's in the lineup with him, and we take them out of the room. Somebody takes them out of the room. Sergeant took care of that. I don't know where he put them. Because we want to talk to Ernie. I want to talk to uh, This is after the lineup. And I hadn't said anything. And so he said, how did I do? At this point, we have rapport. It's almost like he's my buddy. He's a nice guy. I mean, he's a really nice guy to talk to. He's uh, articulate. And uh, so I said, well, Ernie, you didn't do so good. Like, I was sorry for that. Not that I was. He said, well, I guess I better tell you about it. I said, yeah, I think you should. Soon after the trip to Arizona, I had two phone conversations and recorded the stories told by both Robert Jensen and Paul Ulrich. Here are some of the samples on how they contributed to this historic decision. Okay. Okay. That's it. Pretty simple. What we were talking about the other day, 
Um, so, fire away. How did you get involved with the uh, Ernesto Miranda case? Let's start off with that one. So this way you can segue right into it. Truly, by accident, I had uh, moved from the Dorsey firm in Minneapolis to Phoenix. I arrived there at about the same time that the ACLU decided to ask for a uh, petition to the Supreme Court, and they asked that uh, John Flynn, uh, in principle, be the responsible attorney. Of course, a writ of certiorari is a very um, unique animal. You express the reason the court should look at it. One of the reasons we stressed in Miranda was the fact that there was a great deal of uh, division as to both the how the federal courts uh, were interpreting principally Escobedo, a earlier Illinois case, and how the state courts were inter- interpreting Escobedo. So one of our positions was that the court should take this on to its uh, calendar for the benefit of straightening out the federal courts to the extent that there was division and likewise the state courts. So that's how I came to uh, be asked to write the writ was mostly because I had just arrived at the firm and had what you might call a cleaner desk than people who had been there for a while. So it's basically you, you fell into this historical decision pretty much because you were the new guy, right? I mean, it was just kind of like, all right, I let's think, give it to you. Yeah, I think that's a uh, fair um, assessment. I think the firm had some regard for what they regarded as my talents. But to be truthful, um, I had never written a writ of certiorari. I had not specialized in constitutional law at the University of Chicago. And uh, it was not particularly a field of my interest, although um, thereafter I did try a number of criminal cases uh, up to and including double murder case. But um, it was mostly an accident uh, that I simply got the opportunity. And frankly, as you know, writs of certiorari are seldom granted by the number of them that are submitted. And why they picked this case, I'm not sure. It wasn't the completest um, or most complete trial record. And if there had been a better record, I would have thought that the writ uh, would have stood a better chance. There were a number of prominent law firms that were raising the same issue, uh, basically on a pro bono basis as we were. But um, maybe they liked the simplicity of the presentation and somewhat, I think, to the surprise of everyone, uh, the writ was granted, and uh, we then had to begin to prepare a brief. Even the decision itself, right? I mean, it wasn't a unanimous decision. It was actually very close to the Supreme Court. Very, very, cl- very close, absolutely. And I think Flynn had no idea um, whether he was going to carry the day or not, and there were certainly distinguished advocates that were opposing uh, the adoption of what became the Miranda Rule, and there were distinguished advocates in addition to Flynn, who was not at the time regarded as a distinguished advocate, uh, who were arguing for it. So it was, a, it was a real divide within the country. And the moment the opinion came out, there were a lot of people that said, well, this is essentially the end of law enforcement in the United States. The truth of the matter is that, frankly, often to my surprise, um, people charged with crime, if you wa- ever watch ID or some of those channels, Dateline or whatever, 
and you see filmed renditions of the actual um, inquiry as directed to them by the police, they they seem to feel they're up to answer the questions, and you don't see them invoking the right to counsel uh, once they've been given the warning. And it's a little surprising. Is there anybody else you think that would be interested in talking about the case, or anybody that's uh, that's around that would be interested? In, you know, I mean, I spoke to Carol. Cool. No, absolutely. The person that is by far the um, keeper of the flame, if you will, is a fellow by the name of Paul Ulrich, U L R I C H, mm-hmm. and he has written extensively and. Um, thoroughly and at, indeed brilliantly about the case, about the times, and about the subsequent um, effect or lack of effect of Miranda on uh, criminal prosecutions. And he's someone you definitely should contact. You know, I will try to be. Uh, brief in answering your questions, but I can go, you know, uh, with this conversation, I can go for quite a while. Okay, Uh, well, well, this is what I had a couple things I I jotted down. I read the uh, material you gave me. I got my, I think I can get a law degree now. (laughs) Well, good. The Miranda case was tried the first time in 1963 before the Escobedo decision was uh, decided in 1964. And and I think it's important to understand that the objection to Miranda's confession that his appointed trial counsel made was that, quote, the Supreme Court has held that a man is entitled to counsel at the time of his arrest. That was not the law then, and it never really was the law, but that was the objection in the record that the Miranda case started from. So there were a series of cases that uh, extended Gideon into earlier stages. Uh, there, there was uh, Hamilton versus Alabama, which was right to counsel at arraignment. Uh, Carnley versus Cochran held the right to counsel does not depend upon request. White versus Maryland held that a defendant had the right to counsel at a preliminary hearing. So there was a developing body of law extending the right to counsel forward in the criminal process. Now, Escobedo then uh, was was a Sixth Amendment case. The circumstances were that that Danny Escobedo was uh, suspected of murder. He was in custodial interrogation. He asked for counsel. He had a lawyer. The lawyer was trying to get into the police station to see him. And under those circumstances, the majority of the Supreme Court held that there was a right to counsel at the interrogation stage under those circumstances. My team is compiling a comprehensive collection of information, images, maps, and video that we hope will benefit not only my students at John Jay College of Criminal Justice, but anyone interested in studying the topic. It will also be of interest to anyone that is teaching this and can use the materials to help with their curriculum. You can contact my team directly using the following links. And thanks for watching and hope to see you soon. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank the Phoenix Police Museum for helping us with this project. Without you guys, this couldn't have been possible. So thank you very much.